Analytical Epidemiology, Overview of Study Design, Part 2. <clears throat> In our last lecture, we talked about the types of epidemiologic studies uh, and contrasted experimental studies and observational studies. And uh, we will now talk a bit about some types of um, experimental studies. Basically, a defined population uh, is identified. Uh, this can be, for example, a group of people with the same disease. Um, and then that group is randomized, uh, a process in which um, there is a division of the group, usually into two subgroups. Uh, and that is done in such a way that there is no influence on the part of the people making the uh, allocation to the subgroups or putting people into two subgroups. There's no influence on any the, their thinking in terms of how it's done. It's usually done with a random number table, uh, so that takes any sort of potential for what's called a uh, selection bias out of the uh, process. And usually the um, subjects then are, def are, sorry, are placed into one of two groups. One group which receives a new treatment, something that we're trying to find out if it works uh, better than what is currently used to treat the condition. And the subjects are then followed over time and we determine at the end of some time period that's uh, appropriate for the particular condition and treatment, and we determine whether or not uh, people have improved or not improved in each of the groups. And then we can um, develop some measures of association, uh, typically a, a relative risk that tells us um, whether or not the new treatment was, for example, effective. Uh, let me say one other thing here as we are discussing this, that in addition to randomization, there are a couple of other components um, or design features of randomized cl clinical trials that are put in place. One is called blinding, um, and that means that neither the uh, people running the study nor the subjects of the study itself know whether or not they are receiving the new treatment versus the current treatment. So, for example, the pills that are used in the study, whether they contain the new treatment or current treatment, are made to look identical and the same number are taken uh, on the same time, um, in a similar time frame than, that, uh, that the other in the, in the uh, current treatment group is. And <clears throat> then, um, as I mentioned, there is a uh, group that receives a current treatment or sometimes a placebo, but something that um, they receive again so that there's no way to tell um, the difference between those receiving the new treatment and those receiving a current treatment or a placebo. Placebo is something which essentially has no biological effect. So in our um, homework for this uh, week, uh, there was a um, question number three which asked in an experimental study, what is the purpose of randomization of the study subjects? And the uh, primary reason for randomization in experimental studies is in fact, as was just discussed, to reduce the introduction of bias <clears throat> into the allocation of subjects to intervention or no intervention groups on the part of those conducting the study. We don't want to have differences between the two groups, the intervention and no intervention groups, that is perhaps potentially biased by those doing the study and then might cause some difference in the outcome of the study itself. The um, a secondary reason for um, randomization in studies is to, in fact, try to increase the likelihood that the two study groups will be relatively comparable with regard to characteristics about which we may be concerned. For example, the sex distribution in the two groups is relatively 
um, comparable. Um, the age of the people in the different groups is relatively comparable. Uh, however, randomization does not in and of itself guarantee that, and there are uh, other methods, stratification in particular, which can be used uh, to be sure that that the groups are comparable um, if that is a, a great a considerable concern on the part of the investigators. Uh, there are two other answers, I'm sorry, the two other potential answers, B, increase the likelihood that subject with unrecognized disease will receive an intervention rather than no intervention. Um, this is not um, a reason that subjects are uh, randomized and the randomization itself <clears throat> does not really um, impact the cost of conducting the study. In fact, it could conceivably increase the costs. The design of a uh, field trial, uh, which uh, is a little different than the randomized clinical trials that we looked at just a minute ago, <clears throat> in that um, the field trials are typically conducted out in a community um, and the population that constitutes the community um, we typically would exclude people who have for example a certain disease or certain factors that we're concerned about as influencing that potentially might influence the the trial we then randomized the remaining population of subjects into those that are going to either receive the intervention or not receive it. In this case, these are known as the control group. Um, so an example of a field trial might be we are trying to uh, have the uh, one group, uh, let's say we're interested in heart disease, we want the one group uh, to exercise uh, more uh, or say a certain number of times a week whereas the control group uh, is not uh, asked to do that kind of uh, intervention. Again then we follow over time, uh, time usually going this way, um, we follow the subjects and determine the disease status of both those receiving the intervention and those in the control group at the end of the study. We mentioned previously that in, those situ in some situations we really might want to be sure that um, the two uh, populations, the intervention and the no intervention or the treatment and the no treatment populations um, were comparable with respect to certain characteristics so the question itself was the figure below represents what type of study design um, and in fact this is a randomized trial we see this because there's randomization that occurs down here at this point the trial prior to the randomization in order to ensure that we have um, comparability in the treatment and current new treatment and current treatment groups by both sex and age, we stratify the population by those two factors. So you can see here that initially we have a thousand patients. The males are uh, uh, put into one group, females into another. Then within each of those groups, we divide by age. So we have young males, old males, young females, old females, and then each of these groups is randomized into either a new treatment or a current treatment um, group and you can see here how we end up with 500 uh, subjects in each of the treatment groups and they are by this design guaranteed to have the same number of males and females and also the same age distribution. So the correct answer for this particular problem was that this is an example of a randomized trial with stratification. This slide um, shows the different kinds of validity for randomized trials. Uh, if you will recall, uh, we talked about generalizability in our last lecture as a 
uh, a, a potential goal of the study that we're undertaking in that we are interested in um, trying to ensure that the study population itself and the findings on it from the study are applicable to the reference population or the population from which the study population was drawn. So for example, if we select people <clears throat> with the potential for heart disease and um, we want to be able to apply the results of this trial to all people uh, in, you know, in the general population who might have heart disease, we want to try to be sure that in fact our study population is representative of this larger population. Um, that is known as external validity or generalizability. Um, then in addition, uh, we have a concept known as internal validity and this relates to the study itself and it essentially is a measure of whether or not the methods used in the study including randomization um, as well as the um, treatment of the two groups, the new treatment and current treatment groups were essentially comparable so that the study was you know, well designed if you will and carried out and if it is then the study can be said to have internal validity and we can actually make valid comparisons between the new treatment group and the current treatment group. Um, <clears throat> then finally in terms of um, randomized controlled trials and um, as an example of epidemiologic studies there are types of error that can occur in these studies <clears throat> and they are displayed here in this table. Um, two concepts in terms of this tr table. Uh, there's what is real, what is really true. And um, the first reality is that, say, the treatments in the trial are not different. This is also uh, could be uh, viewed as our null hypothesis. In other words, there's no difference between them and then the other possibility is that treatments are truly different. Then there's the actual results from the study uh, in terms of what it shows us and we may conclude from the study that treatments are not different or we may conclude from the study that the treatments are in fact different whether the treatment itself uh, reduces the disease or in fact increases the disease. So um, as we can see in our 2x2 two two table, uh, this cell right here, the upper left cell, corresponds to a correct decision, a true positive, um, in that we know that the, uh, or actually I should say probably here, that this is more like a true negative, in that the treatments are not different, the null hypothesis is accepted. Uh, treatments are not different and we conclude that they are not different. And then down in this corner we have what we might call more like a true positive in that the treatments are in fact different and then we conclude that they are in fact different. Um, this particular cell also represents what is known as the power of a study. Um, we will discuss that at uh, a later time. So that leaves us with these other two cells in which we have a type 1 error in which we conclude that the treatments are different when in fact they are not. Again, a type 1 error is that situation in which the treatments are really not different but our study leads us to believe that they are. Uh, type 2 error is that situation in which the treatments really are different and we conclude however that the treatments are in fact not different <clears throat> and <clears throat> um, a reason that we may conclude it, this in this particular case is that sometimes this, this, this sample size for the study, the number of persons involved in the study is too small 
to in fact uh, give us um, to, to show the difference between um, the two treatment groups so that even though if it had been a larger study, a more robust study, in other words a study with greater power, uh, we would have been able to show that there was in fact a difference between the two.